a appris qu'en fait on avait des adversaires stratégiques dont le but était la déstabilisation de nos systèmes démocratiques. Et l'un des moyens les plus importants utilisés par ces adversaires stratégiques, que ce soit la Russie ou d'autres pays, eh bien c'est le financement direct ou indirect des partis politiques qui visent à déstabiliser les institutions. Abbiamo chiesto né visto né preso un euro di finanziamento dall'estero. A lot of things happened in the last years, like the Ibiza scandal with the Austrian Freedom Party on the extreme right, the Lega Party who got uh, money also from Russian sources, the Rassemblement National uh, from uh, Le Pen who have uh, strong uh, connections also with Russia. And this was how Russian sources bought also their feet into European politics. È giusto eh, da parte nostra insistere con grande determinazione perché noi dobbiamo difendere i valori europei e dobbiamo difendere l'Europa da qualsiasi tentativo di condizionamento esterno. Alors il y, y a différentes manières en fait. Vous avez euh, le cas euh, par exemple du Rassemblement national en France, c'est-à-dire le cas d'un prêt décidé par une banque russe euh, proche du Kremlin. Et donc là, c'est un financement direct, mais sous forme de prêt bancaire. Vous avez aussi des financements indirects. On l'a vu dans la campagne sur le Brexit, où en fait des prêts non anglais étaient euh, engagés par les Russes pour financer la campagne euh, du Brexit. On a aussi des exemples de financement par tierce euh, partie. C'est-à-dire que par exemple, euh, en Allemagne, c'est possible pour euh, un tierce parti de faire campagne au nom d'un autre parti. Donc vous avez par exemple l'AFD qui ne sera pas financé directement mais qui peut bénéficier du soutien dans ces campagnes d'organisations complètement inconnues dont les financements sont complètement opaques et qui font campagne en fait pour l'AFD. Donc c'est de la campagne indirecte. Dobbiamo poi armonizzare le diverse legislazioni nazionali tra di loro. Il fatto che ogni paese si muova in maniera differente o abbia anche regole diverse riguardanti il tema, ad esempio, del finanziamento alla politica, complica tutto e lascia uno spazio a disposizione di chi dall'esterno vuole ingerire, vuole interferire, vuole tutelare i propri interessi che non sono gli interessi europei. But we have to work step by step to establish a European code which is putting clear how transparency is, that no foreign money is coming. Secondly, then to have a harmonized minimum standard in the European Union. And at the end, clear rules everywhere, which at the end makes clear no foreign money into European parties, no foreign money into European decisions and making clear where money is spent for what. There are certain political parties who don't take any donations and others take a lot. And what do you think where more foreign interference can take place? The ones that take donations. And here I think we have room for maneuver to come up with better rules. Eccoci, buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti. Ok, uh, hello, good afternoon, welcome all to this initiative we have promoted as group, the Socialists and the Democrats at the European Parliament. This is an initiative which is really uh, close to our hearts. The title is very important, it's a strong one, European democracy is not for sale. Our values aren't for sale, and we want to defend the values and the principles of Europe. We want to defend Europe from any attempt for interference or uh, external interference, foreign interference in the EU. And it is 
this is the subject we're going to be dealing with. This is a meeting where there are voices from all sides. We're giving life to this uh, discussion and we'd really like to welcome all our guests. I'd like to welcome all the colleagues, the EMPs who will take the floor soon. I'd like to welcome the experts, journalists, all the people who bring as a point of view that we consider important, which is defending Europe and defending our values. I will immediately give the floor uh, to a for an introduction, a video, an introductory video from Elijah Garcia Perez, who will immediately bring her contribution to open up this discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to open this event with touch one of the most important challenges that our democracies are facing today. The Sangdi group has been at the forefront of the fight against foreign interference and it was thanks to our initiative that the European Parliament established this special committee. This information has been in our societies for a long time. However, through the use of the internet, it is spreading faster than ever and some state actors, such as Russia, are trying to undermine our democratic systems and the values of freedom and pluralism. This was apparent already during the last European elections. So we must not uh, be naive. It is clear that uh, there is an interest to see a more divided and weaker European Union. Since the beginning of this mandate, we have been deeply worried about the evidence of interference around national and European elections in favour of anti-EU extremist and populist candidates. As there are no borders in cyberspace, we need to increase international cooperation across different EU institutions and member states, also involving civil society, media, academia and online platforms. We should protect our democracies together. Increasing transparency on the funding received from third countries is a way to improve the quality of our democracies and build stronger institutions to fight against foreign interference. In fact, several investigations have shown that crucial electoral rules have been violated regarding transparency of campaign financing because of dark funding from third country sources. We must focus on our political and legislative actions. In the coming months, we will work on the important review of the regulation on the statute and funding of European parties and foundations, a key tool for addressing our priorities. Stricter requirements on donation and funding from third countries. The Parliament should also increase its calls on member states to urgently reform and coordinate their national electoral laws. It is clear that any electoral interference affects the composition of the EU as a whole and it is our tax to protect it. And we must do it together because united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you for organizing this important debate today and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Well, the message from uh, uh, Madam Irache has already introduced us to the subjects we're going to be discussing during this meeting. This is the first of uh, this type of meeting, the first public meeting we are uh, setting up over the next few months. If we hold together the various initiatives that follow one uh, guide, which is that of defending Europe, defending Europe from any type of external interference. And today, as uh, our, uh, as Madam Michel was saying, we are dealing with an essential aspect, which is transparency from the point of view of relations between the political um, stakeholders uh, who intervene in Europe, political groups, uh, foundation, and everything, foundations, everything that moves even outside of Europe. And we're doing this with the intention of our political group. We want to promote 
the Enge uh, committee, the special committee that is working uh, hard. Many of us are members, has been working for some months now here at the European Parliament, to develop proposals that will allow us to set up or build a better defensive capacity when having to deal with external involvement, external interference, and to go to the heart of uh, uh, what is happening, uh, the history, some dark pages we've seen. We've seen that the external interference, external threats are not just uh, a theory. Uh, it's an attempt that actually took place and it can take place again. So today we're dealing with this. How a more transparent um, type of politics, especially as far as financing is concerned, can contribute to defending our European home. And this is leading us into this theme, especially the introduction by the president of the Inge Committee, Raphael Glucksmann, and I will give him the floor with pleasure. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Pier Francesco, uh, and uh, merci beaucoup à vous toutes, collègues, experts. Vous Thank you, everyone, experts, participants. Thank you. I'm glad that we're holding this event. The special committee that we have created and that we pushed for as a group is the Special Committee on Foreign Interference in Democratic Processes. The aim of the committee is to make our democracies safer, more stable, better defended. We need to end the naivety which was too long present in the, inst in the institutional sphere. Differences do exist and the international law should rule, but there are strategic and ideological adversaries. There are authoritarian regimes that will do anything they can to undermine our democracies. That includes Vladimir Putin's Russia, China, and Erdogan's Turkey too. At the moment, the Chinese government has decided to sanction elected European officials. I'm one of them. And that in also includes the Parliament's Human Rights Committee. What does this underscore? It shows that authoritarian regimes are all-powerful today. They look down on our democratic framework and the rules that we want to apply to international relations. We therefore need to be much more firm than we have been thus far. The first thing is to ensure our sovereignty and defend our democratic institutions. Today, we're being a bit provocative with the title of our event. Democracy is not for sale, but it reflects the urgency of the situation. It's not disproportionate. At this moment, there are political parties that want to undermine European institutions through pseudo-nationalism. They accept to be used like marionettes by hostile foreign powers. This meeting fits in with the work of the special committee we've created and its mandate. Our mandate aims to respond in any way possible to the subversion that is taking place, including subversion through financing of political polities. European election law really differs from one country to another, so it's difficult without harmonization to create what we want, which is a true political space, a true space of European political debate. Each member state has its own rules and regulations, but the loopholes in the European system are having an overall impact, an impact on every single member state. Hostile regimes have decided to attack our institutions and they make the most of every institutional loophole that we've let slip through the gap. We need to close those gaps. 
That's the aim of our committee. Here I should like to thank all of my fellow MEPs in my group. We're also looking at the ideological and political dimension of the debate, including actors in Europe who benefit from foreign interference. We're not scared of naming and shaming them. And what happens with the financing of political parties and through political subversion? There are cash gifts, so these are loans which aim to influence the political elite. We'll hear from experts. Many parties have been funded through bank loans by, by Russians. Here I'm thinking about the National Rally, Le Rassemblement National. The elites are being bought or influenced. This is happening with Russia and China so that they can advance their political ambitions. There are many former officials and leaders who have begun to work for foreign powers. This is also an example of direct foreign interference. We also see funding and these come from donors. This involves the transiting of foreign money to a party, candidate or campaign. We all know the example of the Brexit and Mr. Aaron Banks, one of the main donors to the Vote Leave campaign. He financed that campaign through offshore funds in the Cayman Islands. And many avenues suggest that money came from Russia. It was such a close vote, the Brexit, and the fact that there was potential foreign funding is uh, extremely worrying. There are also smokescreen companies or post box companies which don't have real commercial activity, but they do finance political activity. We're going to talk about this, but there are non-profit organizations such as foundations. These can be a problem because, of course, we do want civil society to be fully involved in public debate. But what about Latvian NGOs that are financed by Russia? What about anti-abortion movements that are very present in Poland today? And they are also financed by Russia and America. There's also the policy of the internet, which has become a non-policed area, but what's happening online can really have an impact on elections and on public opinion. There are very few rules which apply to the internet. Then finally, there's the question of cryptocurrencies and other emerging technologies. These cryptocurrencies operate in darkness and there are no rules which underpin them. These are the threats to which our society is vulnerable. It is so important that we invest massively. We need political and financial capacity. We need ideas and other tools to defend our democratic institutions. We need to fight for transparency, transparency on funding, where funds come from. We need to be the political group in Europe that fights for more open funding. We, and we shouldn't be just defensive in our combat. We need to breathe new life into our democracy. I hope that the presentations and the exchanges that we have today will allow us to further refine our analyses and come up with concrete proposals on how to protect our democracy. It doesn't matter whether we're from uh, the center, the left, the right, or if we're environmentalists, what's important is our common framework, which will allow us to express our agreements, our disagreements, and which will allow our citizens to decide on the politics they want in full independence, in full sovereignty. Sovereignty is a very fashionable world, word across the political spectrum, but someone who really respects sovereignty rejects foreign money, who doesn't allow 
the decisions of the European people to be dictated by the Kremlin, by Beijing, or by Ankara. That's true European sovereignty. We need to reconfirm that. So we need to really look at how we regulate our political life. That's the essence of our committee, and that is the essence of today's meeting. Thank you, Pier Francesco, for having spearheaded the organization of this meeting. This meeting shows that we take this matter of interference very seriously and we are really looking for an overhaul in the way that we're protected and in the way that we protect democracies. Thank you. Grazie, President. Thank you. Well, these introductions from uh, Madam Irache, from Rafael, already tell us what this thesis is at the basis uh, here. And this is what we're going to be discussing with many of our guests, guests who are helping us to deal with uh, a subject that has never really been dealt with uh, uh, openly uh, with public opinion and which we should not be consider as uh, of secondary importance. There's the question of defense sense, but also action in order to strengthen our system. Uh, there will be interventions uh, from our guests, uh, journalists and experts, and they will be followed by answers by, by uh, Gabby Bishop and uh, mm, uh, colleagues who will be present, who will respond and answer what will uh, uh, the questions that have been raised. So it will be Gabby Bishop and Andreas Schieder. We have interpretation into English, French, Italian, and German. I think we've managed to put together a lot of uh, different uh, voices and different opinions. So we'll start with the question of financing politics in Europe with all its needs, the needs for innovation and for harmonization between the various systems and also the various dangers uh, we see in Europe. We'll hear it from Daniela Piccio, who is a professor at the University of Turin. She's a, an expert in financing political parties. She has often dealt with the question of the evolving of the system of um, financing political parties and their impact on the uh, way in which the parties themselves are organized, how uh, choices are made, how it influences choices, what are the problems that arise. Also, which chinks become available uh, for action from outside which will interfere in our demographic life. We've seen situations uh, uh, in Europe and we're going to be talking about them, the French case, the Austrian case and the Italian case. This is okay, I've spoken even too long. I'll give the floor to Daniela Piccio and I'd like to ask her to speak for eight, nine, maximum 10 minutes so that we can maybe have a second round. I even listening to comments that we receive from the, the social platforms and the information uh, we are listening to in these minutes. Professor Peacher. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see me and that you can hear me. I'd really like to thank you for this invitation. It's really a great pleasure for me to be present in this initiative, in taking part in this extremely important initiative. Now, I don't have much time, so I'll try to go straight to the point. A quick premise. I'd like to point out 
that apart from the general theme of the uh, sub of the meeting, democracy is not for sale, is it is a subject that has really been of great concern for the, for the legislator and for the member states of the EU. P politics are not for sale, democracy is not for sale, and it should not be subject to a blackmail or involvement of external um, interests. So the interference in the democratic process is an old uh, problem. It's always been there. And it's now, it's evolving. It's different now. Uh, we've seen what's happened recently and not so recently when we see loans, uh, illegal financing, so, uh, so services that are offered from uh, external foreign sources, sources and this shows the vulnerability of present day democracies. Now I will try to give you a general overview of how uh, to, up to now the legislators have behaved to deal with these concerns. In, on the whole, they've done it through regulating fi financing for parties and also in introducing a system of public funding. Now, I will just touch upon this point, but in order to ensure that politics are not at the mercy of private funding, uh, the state has given a certain... Um, financial support in order to allow them to mobilize, to get organized, have political campaigns without needing money, uh, needing external money. Okay, um, we know that the public funding of parties in Europe and the has not solved the problem of corruption in politics and of politics. Now, don't forget that Europe is a context within which the member states are very generous in paying financing to political parties, but that was not enough. Now, what happened? The public uh, funding uh, has just simply just accompanied the private funding instead of replacing private funding. Uh, here we all agree that no matter how the uh, f uh, public funding can slow down private funding, there are big interests that go looking for money and, uh, the, and changes in the legislation has not been enough. Now, in order to protect and not sell off for democracy at bargain basement prices, the legislator had to intervene, introducing rules on financing, on private funding. Now, the various member states in Europe have tried done this in a stringent way. Usually, we introduce limitations, either qualitative or quantitative limitations on uh, private uh, financing. Qualitative, it, it, we mean that's what happens when the legislator limits the field of possible donors. Basically, there are countries in Europe, for instance, where you can't have donations from uh, big interest groups or from legal entities, for instance, France, Belgium, Portugal, uh, Germany, or restrictions can be quantitative. So basically, there are limits uh, there are maximum levels of funding that they ca you can receive from a private party. Now, um, at this point, uh, when you have the rules on private funding, you get the fo you get foreign interests involved. So the possible sources of funding for uh, politics, uh, which can be citizens, legal entities, anonymous donations, you have this as well, uh, trade unions in some cases, or even religious associations, they're also foreign um, investment, foreign contributions. Now, if you go and look at how the, uh, the uh, foreign uh, donations are regulated, we find, as we heard uh, earlier, that the, the regulations vary from country to country. Just as the regulation of the whole system of political financing in Europe, I don't think one case is similar to the other. So, we can identify three main approaches to the regulations on 
how to regulate the foreign funding. There are two extreme cases. Countries that don't regulate at all, so they allow foreign uh, invest uh, contributions of any type, and others where other countries where they're completely banned, where it is not allowed. And then you get the intermediate solution. Countries who have introduced restrictions, restrictions either qualitative or quantitative, on foreign donations. So we can start immediately by saying of the three approaches, the first one, the one that neither limits nor uh, bans uh, uh, foreign funding uh, is only four countries. At the moment, it's only four countries in the EU. They have, no, have not regulated this at all. Belgium, Denmark, Sweden and the Netherlands. And I would like to point out that the number of countries without any rules at all, so that allow any kind of foreign funding is a group that's becoming smaller and smaller. Recently, uh, not so long ago, there were six countries. There was also France and Italy. Italy has introduced some rules in 2019. And over the last few months, I'd like to mention that one of the four countries I've just mentioned, the Netherlands, there's an ongoing discussion of a draft law that if it were to be approved, it will forbid any donations coming from outside of the EU, which is interesting, this distinction, and it's quite original. The rule, so if it were approved, it will go and hit directly one political party, the Partei für Freiheit, the party, for, the PVV, the extreme right uh, wing with uh, Herbert Wilders uh, leadership and then from the well-known accounting had received f big funds from outside over 130,000 euros uh, from a, a US body that supports uh, the system of Islamization uh, of society. I'm talking of the Horowitz Freedom Center. Now, the group of countries that allow funding from abroad officially is a small number and would appear to be in extinction. Now, apart from those four countries, we have the other 23 member states who have regulated uh, foreign funding, foreign private funding, and these are divided between those who ban them entirely and an approach that limits itself to cap them. The first situation is a majority of European countries, if I'm not mistaken, 13 EU countries, and Italy now is one of them, but amongst the most strict we found Slovenia that doesn't allow any kind of foreign um, funding, even from foreign funds from the same party, or accept services of any kind outside of the Slovak territory. Now, this is just an example. The same for Greece. They don't allow donations from companies but it specifies that it has to be a Greek citizenship to be able to contribute to the political activities of Greek political parties. So these are some cases where it's completely forbidden. Then the last group is a situation where uh, foreign donations are partially admitted, such as in Germany, in Austria, in Bulgaria, in Spain, the law states that parties cannot accept donations from foreign sources, but individual citizens can contribute to a certain level. In Germany, it's 1,000 euros. In Austria, it's 2,500. Uh, in Bulgaria, it's the equivalent of $500, which are the exception to the rule. Other countries have qualitative uh, limitations. Romania and Finland, no foreign funding, unless, with the exception of those which come from international political associate organizations or active groups. So, from this general overview 
of the regulation on foreign funding, at least on paper, this would seem to be under control. And yet, we know, and the people are going to speak after me will prove this, it is not so. Now, I'm moving towards the conclusions as I don't have much time. First of all, it might be banal, but it's not enough to have a law. It has to be implemented. And at the moment, uh, in order to ensure that the regulation on foreign political funding is applied, you've got to have some controlling bodies, auditing bodies, to ensure that the rules are respected. And they shouldn't exist only on paper from a formal point of view, but they actually have to be endowed with uh, an operational capacity so that they can carry out their monitoring activities. And these aspects are lacking, usually, in the uh, legislation on foreign funding in European countries. And the same goes for, as far as loopholes are concerned, the question of transparency is lacking on private funding in general, and foreign in particular, it's extremely difficult to access the information. And of course, you also have third party donations that were mentioned in the introduction. However, I mean, these rules have to be strengthened, but it might, but that might not be enough. Earlier I mentioned funding from the Horowitz Freedom Foundation to the uh, Dutch Party for Freedom. This funding is, is legal, but the information and news from not so long ago, Builders himself received it from another U.S. Uh, think tank with a similar type of ideology, 175,000 euros as a contribution for the court case he's had to deal with when he was inciting to discrimination. But uh, Wilders did not declare this financing. Yes, I'm concluding. He didn't declare it in the ledger on donations, uh, nor did he declare it neither on his name or of the party. Why? Well, because this sum was paid by a foundation directly to his lawyer. To, so to adapt the rules on foreign funding is important, but the interference in democratic process take place in many different ways. So politics, you can buy it and you can sell it. So I'll stop here. I apologize if I've taken too much time. And I, I'm here for the discussion. We can, and I'd like to thank you. Grazie. Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Daniela Piccio. I have to apologize for having interrupted her, but of course I'll have to if I want to allow everyone to take the floor to be able to discuss things. This is an extremely complex subject. Daniela Piccio has described it and also explained the fact that a system that is apparently that is formally okay is not sufficient to stop these attempts of interference. The next speaker... The next guest that we really like to welcome and thank him for his problem for his presence is going to tell us about what actually happens in real life. Kai Jan Kreiner, who is a member of the Austrian Parliament, uh, head of delegation of the Special Investigation Committee on the so-called Ibiza case. So the connection between the extreme, uh, uh, the, the Russian extreme right in Austria, which allows us to really get into the heart of one of the most troubling uh, cases, if I can use that term. You have the floor, sir. Yes, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and greetings from Vienna. Um, I'm in this special investigative committee, uh, in the Ibiza committee, as we call it, in Austria. Um, what is this all about? 
Uh, a video was taken uh, a few months before the uh, FPÖ, our extreme right-wing party, entered the government with the Conservative Party in 2017, in December 2017, uh, which was taken over by Mr. Kurz just a few weeks before the video was shot. Uh, the party leader, uh, Mr. Strache, who then became vice-chancellor, and uh, another leading party member, Mr. Gudenos, who became chief whip of the FPÖ parliament group after they joined government, uh, were filmed uh, just a few weeks before the election in 2017, um, talking to a Russian oligarch uh, daughter or, or, or a niece, um, where they were willing to sell any government action, any law, Uh, for uh, media coverage and or money. Um, and the task of this Ibiza uh, committee is uh, to, to look if it was just a genre picture of the extreme right wing or if the collision between the Conservative Party and the FPÖ um, really did sell laws and other government action for money or for other um, favors. Um, the findings so far, to make it short, uh, first we saw very uh, strong ties to the gaming industry, um, also of the FPÖ, but even a lot more stronger from the Conservative Party. Um, in the meantime, two former um, ministers of finance from the Conservative Party and the current uh, ministry, minister of, of uh, finance of the Conservative Party are under uh, investigation from the public prosecutors Uh, because of um, ties to the gaming industry, because of um, they're, they're, they're looking into uh, donations that might have been made to the Conservative Party and to influence being made by the Conservatives in favor of uh, certain gaming industry um, firms. Um, second cluster is uh, pri private clinics. Um, we, we have a, actually not that bad public health system, but there are also a certain number of private uh, clinics in Austria, and both parties received donations from private clinics before the, uh, the, the election 2017, and uh, they passed a law adding millions of public money to this industry after the election. Uh, the Public prosecutors are now looking into uh, inves investigating actually very, very uh, clearly against Mr. Strache himself, the former vice chancellor from the uh, FPÖ party, and the former finance minister of the conservatives, Mr. Lueke, and our current uh, president of our parliament, Mr. Zobotka, uh, because of um, this, this financing um, Of, of, the, of parties through private clinics, through private hospitals, and the passing of, of laws to, in their favor just a few months after the election. The third um, thing, major thing is uh, that the Conservative Party is being looked at uh, because of interventions into the public prosecutor system. Um, the highest... Um, Uh, of official of the Ministry of Justice uh, has been suspended and uh, a senior public prosecutor has been stripped of his rights um, because of the work of the committee. Um, there is a reasonable suspicion by public prosecutors that through these two um, information on actions that were planned by pl public prosecutors, uh, house searches and things like that against Uh, high officials of the, or former high officials and current high officials by the Conservative Party um, were told to these people prior uh, to these actions uh, that could have been taken. Um, a fourth thing that we found is um, that the FPÖ was setting up a financing tool, um, not so much for itself, but we believe... Uh, also for other extreme right-wing parties, for their sister parties in other Euro European countries. Uh, it looked this way that a oligarch from a Eastern European country tried to buy a small Austrian private bank, 
which was supported by the FPÖ. Uh, the FPÖ could nominate a seat on the board, which they did, um, and they were promised 10 to 15 million uh, credit line annually for campaigns. Uh, first of all, you have to know that there is a, a cap on national campaigns in Austria, which is half of, of this number, about 7 million um, euros. And the public financing of parties in, is, uh, in, in Austria is so high that actually you don't need private money. Um, so that's why we think it was not actually for themselves, but for other um other other uh, sister parties in other uh, countries that don't have such a high public financing to um, political parties. Um, the good thing about it is that the Financial Supervision Authority of Austria stopped the deal because uh, the person from from a Eastern European country that wanted to buy the bank was too shady in the eyes of the Financial Supervision Authority of Austria, and therefore the the deal broke. Um, even though it was just, you know, 10 minutes before the finish line. And we found um, documents that support exactly what happened, that the FPÖ had a member on the board and was promised this credit line. Um, there's a lot of different other things that we're looking into, but I, I just, uh, to, to keep it short and simple, those were the four things I wanted to share. And I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion and thank you for listening to me. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Cayenne Kreiner also for having stayed within the time limit, but especially for this information he's given us, this story he's told us. There's another. A uh, really troubling uh, situation is the Italian one, the Italian situation. The attempt of an interference uh, between uh, Putin's people and the Lega, Matteo Salvini's Lega. Now, he won't only deal with, uh, mention what happened, but we are talking about something else as well. But we'll listen to Giovanni Tizian, who's an investigative journalist, and he's the co-author of a recent book, The Black Book of the Lega. And he's written this with Stefano Vergine, and we, who already uh, spoke to our committee. Tiziano, you have the floor. Hello. I'd also like to thank you for this invitation. It's essential to talk about a subject like this, which is at the heart of a democracy. It has to do with Europe and it has to do with Italy. We're talking about illegal funding of parties, which has been going on for years now. Now, with Stefano Vergine, we wrote this book, The Black Book of the Lega, which is an international scoop, and it had to do with Matteo Salvini's party, the Lega. It started as a northern party, it was federalist, and then uh, uh, Matteo Salvini becomes the secretary and it becomes a, a nationalist party, a sovereignist party in 2018. It becomes the face, the first uh, party in Europe. So it has become it now has an importance that it didn't have in the past. Now, this has uh, given uh, a rise to international interest, especially in Russia. But this involvement with Russia that we've discussed at length, but now uh, the information which has arrived is this meeting between Moscow, the Metropole Hotel, between emissaries from the, uh, uh, Salvini's people and uh, people from the Kremlin. And this was on the 17th of October 2018. In the hall of the Metropole Hotel, we saw, there was a video, and we also got the audio, so which proves what we already knew, that that meeting was to discuss a funding for the party. As we said earlier, not with a briefcase full of money, but it was really a mega supply of oil, GPL. Oil. 
three million uh, uh, fuel oil, sorry, three million tons plus another three. We're talking millions of euros. Uh, they, there was to be a discount to be applied, and the discount would have funded the party. It was uh, Giulica Savoini who was the uh, representative of the Lega, so he was really his right-hand man. And in Russia, the media before our scoop, he was defined as a consigliere of Salvini, uh, even though he had no real role in the party. But basically, he was a very important person within the Lega. Now, at the Met in the Metropole, we're not only talking about this supply, but also the big energy companies who would have done this. On the one hand, they talk about Grossvent, which is governed by, it is made one of the most, the people, the men closest to Putin, Sekin, and on the other hand, the ENI, which is the uh, state uh, body, state company in Italy, now, they've always said that they were not part of this discussion because this was the name of this company was mentioned at the table. And there was, the, there was Yakun Intu, someone who's very close to uh, one of the uh, members of United Russia. Now, I also wanted to stress another point, but I'm going to tell you something else, which is not so much a question of the Metropole and Russia, but in what Savoini says, and which we show in our book, in our investigation, Savoidi, he's there as a politician, and you can tell from the words he uh, speaks, to introduce the whole business deal, basically, he explains to the Russians the importance of uh, supporting sovereignists, because they are, and I quote, friends of Russia, against the Brussels elite. Now, here you can already understand the whole a sovereignist story we've been listening to over these last few years. And Savoini repeats these slogans there in the Metropole. There's this request you get to the Metropole after this, this. It took months, if not years, to get to that negotiating table. Don't forget, when Salvini became secretary of the League of the Lega, at the General Assembly that nominates him, you see Alexei Komov there. We'd never seen a, such an important Russian presence within a... Uh, a national party, but a party like the Lega, which is a very small party. So it's really a change, a whole strategy that Salvini is developing. And the president of the World Congress of Family, one of the most obscurantist, anti-abortion, anti-gender rights, uh, uh, who's got Malevich, who is a, a Russian oligarch, who leads this family party. And there too he's funding the Lega. So then this business deal at the Metropole doesn't happen because following our investigation uh, there was a, a, an investigation on international corruption uh, by the court, Italian court. So apart from any criminal cases, an enormous political case. An Italian parliament hasn't dealt with this at all. We too were expecting an investigation committee on the involvement of the Russians in Italian politics. After our scoop, it was, uh, pro they promised it, but meanwhile, three years have gone by, and now there's no trace of it, because unfortunately the question of polit funding political parties in Italy is an extremely sensitive topic. Now, the extreme right is has shown that, that it is connected to Putin's Russia. With Stefan and I also described this in another article, and it's in, an, in the same book. The strategy of people who are tied to the Lega, but also for some more as neo-fascists, 
to bring uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen to the Crimea to invest through uh, associations. In the case of the fascists of Forza no uh, Nuova, uh, were like Alexandrine, they were supposed to sponsor our businessmen. And some of our businessmen in Russia, you have also um, Savoini, who has this association, Lombardia, Russia. And the idea is that you take businessmen to Russia. So here you see this contradiction with these sovereignists. It should be a project where you are protecting the national interests, but uh, at the end of the day, behind this sovereignist flag and nationalistic flag, they are taking Italian companies to Russia. They're taking them abroad, so it's not nationalistic. So often what we say as journalists isn't always uh, have any criminal consequences, but it does have an importance, a social importance. And uh, this attempt to finance, whether Russia tried to give money to the Lega, we went through uh, a past question uh, that I've already published, actually. This cent uh, center for cult uh, Russian culture which you find throughout Europe, but in Italy as well. And the president, up to not so long ago, was someone whose daughter, Irina Cosimova, was a candidate in, in the Sovereignist Party for the municipal uh, election in Rome and she was a candidate to mayor in an extreme right wing uh, party. So these centers for Russian culture in some intelligence reports are defined as one of the possible channels used by the Kremlin to finance movements, parties, uh, defend the Kremlin's interests in Italy. Now, obviously, what are the Kremlin's interests? Well, we discovered this following a little Matteo Salvini's people. And the interests of the Kremlin is that of destabilizing Europe officially. That is their objective. They want to break the balance with the weakness of the EU. Of course, the Kremlin will uh, take advantage of it. But there's also another aspect that is not considered much, uh, which in Italy happens though. In Italy, many oligarchs very close to Putin own property. And with these, some of these uh, sanctions, uh, they were frozen. Uh, these company, these goods or these properties were bought through straw men, uh, shell companies, whatever, but they have been blocked. So Putin's interest is also that of no longer having these sanctions to do a, fa make a, do a favor to his friends, and which is very simple, it's very banal, but it is there too with this attempt to support the extreme right-wing parties. So that's a general overview. Then, if you want to go more into detail, I'm here. Perfect. Thank you, Giovanni Tizian. That's a general overview which we've received, and it's really uh, troubling again. So now, from the Italian uh, uh, situation, we move on to France. There, too, it's still connections with Russia. In 2014, the Front National received loans from Russia. I think 11 million euros. There was a very complicated uh, story developed uh, and uh, mentioning it allows me to introduce Jean-Yves Jean Camus. He's a journalist, a politologist, he's an expert in the extreme right, the director of the Obs uh, Observatory of Political uh, Radicalism of the uh, Jean Jaurès Foundation and he will tell us about the French situation which is just so similar to what we've just heard up to now. You have the floor. Je vous remercie. Uh, le... Thank you. The funding of the National Front, now the National Rally, is a subject that should be examined from 
two angles. There's the Russian angle. Russia pursues its own strategic interests, which includes weakening the EU from the inside. That will strengthen Russia's own influence and it would lead to a situation we had before where there was Russia and the US even if it meant that Russia was secondary inferior to the US but you have to ask yourself the question why would a nation channel money to a political party I've been looking over the last 30 years at the ideas of the National Front and the National Rally. Russia has decided to lend money to the National Front. And we certainly don't know everything that's happened. But Russia's done that because the National Front is a party in France that wants to move France away from the EU. The National Front often asks for sanctions against Russia to be lifted because the National Front wants to come into power and they want to have a model of society that is similar to the Russian one. Let me explain. If we look at values, the logic pursued by the National Rally is very close to the Russian one. So that means sovereignty, power, the calling into question of some democratic powers in favour of an autocratic system. They see the family as the central cell of society which will protect society from liberals and others. All those who want to pass laws that would apparently call into question the traditional family model. In the National Rally, there's a lot of sympathy for post-communist Russia and how it has returned to its religion and to its past. And there's return to Russia pre-1917. So Russia is a model that the national rally wants to follow. It is a model that the national that the national rally would adopt if it came to power so the national rally is interested in the personality of vladimir putin but is also interested in russian society it sees uh, russian society as the only healthy part that is left of europe so they are um, extremists but they see these orthodox parts of Europe as the only part of Europe that's managed to maintain itself against uh, globalization. So for Marine Le Pen and for Jean-Marie Le Pen, traditional Europe, where society is healthy, where individuals are still healthy, is in Russia and some other central and eastern European countries where there is, where there are all uh, authoritarian leanings such as Hungary and Poland. So all of this leads to supply and demand of Russian funding. But the problem since 1972 in the National Front is that there are some militants And there's a mismatch between the number of militants and the number of votes the party gets. 
If you look at 2017, in the second round of the presidential elections, Marine Le Pen got 10 million votes. So she got 10 million votes in that election. But the number of militants, the number of party faithful paying membership fees stood at a mere 30 to 40,000. So that's a strange, unique ratio. What does that ratio mean? This is a party that is very present in all elections. However, it is a party that can't fund itself. The National Front can't fund itself from party member contributions alone. That means the National Rally finds it difficult to get loans from French banks. It's not because there's some kind of conspiracy theory against the National uh, Rally by French banks, no. They can't get a loan from French banks because they're seen as a wasteful party that doesn't have good management. They're spendthrifts and that means they're risky borrowers. So if you're a risky borrower, if you're an individual risky borrower, or if you're a risky party, the banks don't want to lend to you. That's why this party turned elsewhere. So I just want to stress this. It didn't, this party didn't turn actually to the Russian state. It turned to certain individuals who sometimes represent diverging political interests. You have to understand that. When we talk about Russia and the funding of European political parties and the interference in political parties, that's not quite right. Because there is the Russian apparatus which has its ideological interests, but others have different political interests. Think of Mr. Yakuni, who defends an ideological agenda and a business agenda. So within the Russian state, we need to identify different individuals and different circles of power around Pountin. And we have to we have to identify who are the most active in the funding of the National Rally. There are two key figures. Mrs. Yakunin, who used to run the Russian rail network, and is a friend of Mr. Mariani. And Mr. Mariani was part of the French-Russian friendship group for many years, an influential group. Then there's a, there's Konstantin Malofeyev, a Russian oligarch, who is more monarchical. He's a traditional orthodox figure. He's very involved in the World Congress of Families, which he funds. And in recent years, he has seemed to hesitate between providing aid to the National Rally in its current iteration led by Marine Le Pen and whether he should fund Marion Maréchal Le Pen's network and the Lyon Institute she's founded called LICEP. Ma Ma Maréchal Le Pen is much more traditional, much more conservative and that's apparently more in line with Konstantin Fafiev's uh, values. But we shouldn't just look at the aid and the funding received by the National Rally. This is going to be part of the 2022 presidential election discussion. We need to look at Marion Maréchal Le Pen and whether she tries to take the reins of power after 2022. We need to look at her entourage and hers links to Russia. So we need to look at ESEP, her institution, and 
the links it has with the University of St. Petersburg. That's a legal link, there's no problems there. But we don't know how much funding has been given within the framework of that agreement. And in return for funding, this institution spreads ideas and ideologies and that's that's in return for the funding. So we shouldn't just look at the national rally, the Rassemblement National. There are many smaller uh, right-wing or extreme right-wing cells in France that receive money from Russia. So in Paris, at the annual uh, embassy celebration, the Russian ambassador invites Marine Le Pen and uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen. But there were also many other uh, people present. They were invited and I wonder why they were invited. You have just one minute, thank you, sorry. I'll conclude there, thank you. Ringrazio tantissimo. Thank you. And I'm sorry that I have to cut people off, but that's the, the only way we can uh, manage anyway. Um, Mr. Camus has given us some very uh, interesting information uh, which we'll come back to. There's the complexity of the relationship in this grey area, politicians that intervene in uh, uh, Europe, uh, Russian interests, uh, cultural projects that are at the basis of this uh, dangerous relation. So uh, and now I'd like to give the floor to my last guest, Josh Ru uh, Rudolph from the Alliance for Securing Democracy. He's a researcher and he's dealt with the question of malignant funding. So basically, all the financial loopholes that are exploited by those who are trying to fund uh, political influences. You have the floor, sir. Well, uh, grazie, Mr. Chairman, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, thank you for, for inviting me back to, to speak with you again. And, and also thanks for, for leading the charge against covert funding of political activities by, by foreign donors. donors. If we could um, start the, the slide presentation now, that would be terrific. As my research uh, and, and, and now your, your committee's work are, are, are showing the world, frankly, covert foreign money is the most underappreciated external threat to Western democracies. Over the past decade, Russia, China, and other authoritarians have funneled more than $300 million into 33 countries to interfere in democratic processes more than 100 times. On the next slide, <clears throat> please. About half of those cases involve Russia operating in Europe, and we heard just now these um, three uh, examples in Italy and, and Austria and France. But this has afflicted almost every EU member state, and it's a global phenomenon too, targeting Africa, North America, Asia Pacific, with increasing activity coming from China as well. And as you can see in the icons labeled in the legend here, uh, I've categorized the caseload into the seven most exploited legal loopholes, which I'll come back to in a moment to talk about solutions. But first, on the next slide, please, let me show you how it's getting worse. It used to be just two to three new cases a year, but with sweeping campaigns launched by Presidents Putin and Xi in the middle of the last decade, there's now 15 to 30 new cases annually. Again, each one of these cases being similar to, to the, um, each of the, the, the three that we just heard about today. So a lot of bad activity. When I testified on December 2nd, I, I walked through some examples of each of these. So I want to spend more time today talking about solutions to the seven loopholes that we, that we identified. On the next slide, please, I was 
I, I was very honored and, and pleased to see last week that the committee has been hard at work since December preparing this second working document, which is just fantastic. It shows that this committee's work is, like I said, ahead of any other government in the world in grappling with this challenge of covert foreign money. Both this working document and the discussion um, at the hearing last, last week, last uh, Tuesday, March 16th, they both mirrored and were organized around these seven loopholes. So I will structure the remainder of, of my remarks today around them as well. On the next slide, please. First is in-kind contributions, which are anything valuable in elections that, that don't fit within the statutory definition of donations. The classic example is the one that we just now uh, heard about foreign loans to Marine Le Pen's political party, a loophole that I understand uh, France has, for some reason, only closed for lending entities, not for, for lending individuals from abroad. The important thing to do uh, is to, to prevent any foreign legal person from providing anything of value. By the way, th this is the single biggest loophole in, in the United States as well, which is why Donald Trump was able to ask Russia for dirt on Hillary Clinton or to hack her emails, ask WikiLeaks to release it, ask Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden, ask China to buy soybeans in, in politically important uh, areas ahead of the election. So we in the United States need to fix that. Uh, one thing that we do have in, in the U.S., and we're trying to enforce it better, is uh, uh, recommendation number two on this page, which is a Foreign Agents Registration Act. Europe desperately needs this, mandatory, up and down, all government institutions. In fact, if you were to ask me uh, to pick just two solutions that are not yet included in the second working document released by the committee last week, but they should be included, one would be a truly mandatory and strict European requirement for foreign agent reg registration. And that also relates to the, uh, on the next slide, please, the other uh, th th thing that I, that I think definitely needs to be added um, to, to, to the committee's work is a requirement to report foreign offers of election assistance. In fact, at last week's uh, hearing, I believe it was Mr. Sandro Gozi who very rightly recommended this idea. Politicians should be criminally liable if they fail to immediately report uh, to, to law enforcement contacts that they have with foreign powers offering election assistance. And so that would cover meetings that took place in all three of the cases that we just heard about today. Someone understood to be the niece of a Russian oligarch um, offering Heinz Christian Straka help with, with financing or media. Uh, Kremlin proxies Alexander Babakov or Konstantin Malafif helping to arrange funding for Marine Le Pen's party. Matteo Savini meets with the Russian Deputy Prime Minister in Moscow about political financing, and then um, Gianluco Savioni uh, irons out the details the next day at the Metropole Hotel. If politicians even talk to foreign powers about how they could help them win elections, then uh, and they do not report that information uh, about those contacts to their own law enforcement agencies, they should go to jail. On the next slide, please, uh, we, we need uh, transparency around... Uh, around both shell companies, well, I, I should say transparency on shell companies, and then a prohibition against donations by subsidiaries of, of foreign parent companies. On the next slide, please, nonprofits may be the single most problematic conduit in, in Europe. Uh, with, with Heinz Christian Straka, we just heard about the case of his scheme to funnel money from uh, Eastern European oligarchs' bank. But what we also know from the Ibiza video um, is that he said that the FPO funnels donations through a nonprofit association to, quote, circumvent the court of auditors. La Lega successfully amended um, Italy, Italy's new foreign source uh, ban, with uh, which Miss Picchio uh, mentioned was introduced in 2019. Yes, it was very good. Now that now it's illegal foreign donations in Italy, but it's only partially because La Lega was able to get an exemption for foundations, associations, and committees, so they too can use nonprofits as a conduit to bring in foreign money. And I should add, Alternative for Deutschland does this too, funneling enormous amounts of dark money through an NGO with foreign ties 
theirs is called the Association for the Preservation of the Rule of Law and Civic Freedoms. Um, if surveillance of um, AFD party funding continues, it should cover that NGO because they spend more money in elections supporting AFD than even AFD itself spends. Now, regulation of nonprofits was a subject of debate at last week's hearing. I believe it was uh, Ms. Um, Viola von uh, Cramon who cautioned against limitations on N NGO funding because laws like that are abused in, in Hungary, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria to harass civil society. And she is absolutely right. That is why I'm not recommending limitations or prohibitions on domestic NGOs. My recommendations are, are twofold, as you can see on the screen here. First, foreign NGOs, just like any other foreign person or entity or company, should not be allowed to give political donations. So that's the problem with the Italian law that I just mentioned. And then number two here, domestic NGOs, um, you, you need transparency. These are NGOs like the ones I just mentioned in, in Austria or potentially in Germany, uh, although that one it's not entirely clear because it's only presence in Germany is a, a post office box that, that forwards to an opaque Swiss public relations firm, Goal AG. But truly domestic NGOs should be allowed to, of course, spend money on politics if that's what the, the national laws uh, permit. But, but they they should have to disclose the identities of their donors if they're spending money on politics. I don't think basic transparency is too much to ask of NGOs engaged in politics. On the next slide, please. The key principle for, for advertisements is reflected well in the working document, which is that online political ads should be subject to the same rules as print and broadcast media. Most importantly, we need uh, public archives or libraries to be able to see the details around ads, including the money. Uh, on the next slide, please, uh, he, this is an analogous recommendation for fringe media outlets, like those that Russia has supported all over Europe to host uh, manipulative articles stoking nationalism, xenophobia, now misinformation about vaccines. Uh, we need public archives or, or libraries to be able to see transparently who is funding medium-sized uh, media outlets. And then lastly, on the next slide, um, public donations sh should not come in the form of anonymous mediums like, uh, like cryptocurrency, and, and, and small donor identities should be disclosed as well. On the next slide, I mean, that's the end of, of my, my policy research on this and, 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 and the conclusion of my slide presentation. So we can turn off the PowerPoint, and I'll just finish by saying that I know that these recommendations are politically difficult. Most of them are unaddressed in the United States as well, although they are included in what's called our H.R. 1 legislation that passed one House of Congress and is supported by President Biden. Um, so I think that this is the moment for, for all of our democracies to build resilience to covert foreign money, and, and your committee is absolutely leading the pack on the world stage. So, so please keep up the good work, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you, really, and thank you for the encouragement too. We really want to insist on this. We are firm. We definitely want to defend our political system, but mainly the democratic values that are at the basis of the European Union. And we want to defend them from external interference, no matter where they come from. We've spoken at length. We've really discussed the responsibility uh, what's coming from uh, Russia, but uh, obviously this, as far as this approach is concerned, we want to uh, show that we are fighting for this. I'd now like to ask our guests to take part in a, a brief uh, round, and we need to take three minutes. I would be even more obnoxious than I was earlier, but I will give a question each amongst those that we've already selected here from uh, this first uh, introduction. So we'll start with Daniela Piccio. The question is the following. Now, it was fairly obvious in her introduction that there are 
many loopholes present in the various European legislations. I, uh, unfortunately, I had to interrupt her when she was looking at these, uh, looking at this. So I'd like to ask her to tell us how can we deal with these loopholes, according to her. Uh, you have three minutes, literally three minutes. Thank you for the question. The speaker before me has already made some excellent uh, recommendations. Of course, we must remember, though, that we are within the EU with 27 member states, and each one has its uh, different uh, law. So the challenge here is uh, a difficult one. So I, too, would like to thank you for your work. Well, trying to establish limitations, or at least establish... Uh, for ex uh, foreign donations is uh, uh, useful. Following the German or the uh, Austrian uh, model, something else that could be applied quite simply, if there were the political will, of course, from the side of the member states, would be that of encouraging the introduction of a ledger, a register, for funds which arrive from abroad. In this way, we could have a system of publi publicizing this register and it can be disseminated either by the monitoring bodies uh, when they are ordered the political parties, the ones who have a separate administration within, separate accounting with, on, on their website, for instance, or where they submit their uh, paperwork and their activities and their actions and their recommendations. Or we could also ask the political parties themselves, and there I'm in line with the speaker before me by Josh Rudolph on the fact that political parties should take an active uh, part in this process. So as they are everywhere obliged to submit their accounts online by putting in their budgets, their annual budgets and the and their accounting uh, their internal audits may be well it should be they could publicize using public funding as the excuse and have maybe um, you could reduce the public funding if this were not done some sort of little fine this is a suggestion then I will conclude we also have to adapt the uh, legislation on uh, uh, political campaigns, electoral campaigns. This is essential. It's really necessary. This is something that all member states should do. We have to consider the digital platforms at which, on which political campaigns are now taking place. This is not directly connected with, that, with funding, but it is certainly connected to external influences on the electoral process. I can conclude with this. I hope I respected the three minutes. Perfect, yes. Thank you. Yes, and that question of a register, of a ledger, is something that we'll pick up. It's something that we can come back to in the future. So I'll give the floor now to Kai Jan Kreiner, who really spoke at length about the connection between the Austrian extreme right and Russia. And I would like to ask him if Lisa could tell us the funding that has arrived from Russia uh, they did, whether they condition the political line, what is his opinion on this? Um, maybe, maybe two things, because uh, we, I was asked before um, how the FPÖ said that they uh, have non-profit organizations where they channel uh, donations through uh, so the court of audit doesn't see it. Um, the FPÖ in the 2017 election had a couple of um, 10,000 donations directly into the party and 
um, a couple of hundred thousand um, channeled through uh, NPOs, nonprofit organizations. Um, on the other side, the conservatives had millions directly into the party, almost three million, and we're still counting how much money through uh, NPOs. So it's a, it's a lar much larger scale um, of, of financing that we see uh, at the conservative party. Um, the the right-wing FPÖ party, um, money from Russia, we didn't find any direct money from Russia, but that has to do with that the public funding of parties in Austria is not the lowest within the European Union, I believe, but I think among the... Um, the, those who, who spent uh, the most money for their political parties. What we have done is that we tightened the rules on uh, financing, on donations. Uh, we have uh, uh, very low uh, limits now on donations, uh, per donate, donation and uh, donations taken annually by a party. Um, the second thing is that this hasn't been in, in, uh, put in place yet, but uh, we are discussing of uh, how how many rights uh, the court of audit should have to look into the party books, um, and and not only have um, third party uh, auditors to look in the party books, but have the the court of audit do it themselves. Um, that is a discussion that is going on, uh, but the limitations I think annually uh, are now around seven hundred thousand euros per year that a party. Uh, is allowed to take donations and uh, a single donation will, is not allowed to be above something like two and a half or three and a half thousand uh, euro uh, but single donation means annual donation by one entity yes um, that that is a, a short brief I hope I answered your question if I didn't uh, just ask again ringrazio thank you Thank you for your contribution. Giovanni Tizian, I wanted to ask you to add something to what you said earlier on the interests of the Russian oligarchs. What type of objectives do they have and what their economic interests are that's at the basis of the fact that they are so active? Well, it's quite a few interests, actually. They are Italy, there are regions where they've invested a lot of money in the past. We have a criminal organization, clans which come from Russia, a, a Russian mafia, that have now got their business in Italy and they are um, um, allied to our own mafia association, mainly the Ndrangheta, which is the most important one in Italy. So the interests of some oligarchs that are tied with organized crime is that of money laundering. I mentioned uh, Constantine Margrim. Now, he was discovered, thanks to journalists' uh, investigation, that he was the owner, even though it didn't appear so. He owned a luxury villa in Tuscany that he bought through a, tr a triangulation with the offshore companies. Uh, that's what's happened. And it was a reinvestment into an economy, an Italian economy, that before the health crisis, before the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there was a lot of tourism, and it was a rather wealthy area. Then if you add to this, The fact that the basis of this financial agreement, there's also an ideological agreement. In our book, we've explained how this relation between the, uh, Putin's philosopher or ideologist Dubin ha and people from the from the uh, the Lega, mainly Savoini, 
the Russians had set up a series of uh, cultural and editorial activities on the basis of their Euro-Asian or Eurasian movement. Uh, and they set up uh, websites as if they were newspapers where they had their own production. Now, these newspapers, people of the Lega, mainly Savoini, they were interviewed or even wrote articles. We always wondered, we've never been able to prove it, how much they paid for an article. Uh, how much do they pay Savoini an article? Because if you think about it, that's a very easy way to send money. Of course, we never had proof. We could never prove it. We never had the details. But it's interesting that when you look at uh, ideological affinity, you can also uh, attach economic support, monetary support to this. Thank you. Let's come back to Janiv Kamu. Following uh, what Tizian said, it's all very clear. Uh, Mr. Camus's uh, words, it's very clear what the, uh, the fr extreme right, uh, the French extreme right, with this connection, dangerous liaisons with uh, uh, Russian areas. But we can maybe discuss better uh, what their interest is from the point of view of the Russian interests in having such a strong relation with the French extreme right. Ça leur apporte que uh, it brought them from 2010 to 2012. Well, this was a high level decision, and it meant that more traditional parties in France, like the Républicains. They were, they took a more Atlanticist turn that Russia didn't like. So, Russia didn't like this. So there was a, a turning point of President Sarkozy to lean more towards the US. This continued under Francois Hollande. Uh, Francois Hollande would wouldn't uh, be silent about the annexation of Crimea either. So there was this idea in Russia. Since the more traditional right in France is no longer to our liking, we need to maintain some contacts in France with the uh, traditional right, but we mustn't put all of our eggs in the same basket. We should also get more interested in the extreme right. So it was Russia kind of taking out an insurance policy. It's a country, Russia, which far f which has not uh, broken ties or cut ties with the traditional right, far from it. But they thought, well, Marine Le Pen could be president one day and so could Marion Maréchal Le Pen. So Russia thought it was in his interest to maintain uh, contacts. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you for this further uh, explanation. I'd like to conclude the second round by asking Josh Rudolph a question. And I must ask him to take three minutes. But he was very careful with the typing earlier. So, my question. We've spoken at length of relations with Russia, attempts coming from Russia, we know of attempts coming from China. Now, I saw in your slides you were referring to the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. So I was to, to ask uh, Josh Rudolph to say something more about this. So whether there too were dealing with an attempt to interfere. Thank you. Yes, you, you you were very observant on that on that map. I didn't even mention that, but it was it was shown there. There's a lot of activity from Russia and from China, but but also from from some mi mi Middle Eastern monarchies. So um, uh, Iran was there. Iran is particular is is more active in some of the other 
vectors, um, c cyber activity, uh, information operations. The UAE is an interesting case. In fact, the the single biggest example that we know of, of foreign money uh, involved in the 2016 U.S. election had nothing to do with Russia or, 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 or China um, or Donald Trump. It, it was actually the Emiratis um, f funneling significant amounts of money, millions, to the campaign of, of Hillary Clinton. Um, it has not been proven that the campaign knew, knew anything about it, but they were, using, they were using straw donors and sophisticated laundering techniques, um, using an, an executive in Silicon Valley who knew how to funnel payments through retail, internet retail um, operations. Um, they're going and in, in, from from Abu Dhabi going to meet uh, the, the candidate and um, sending secret WhatsApp messages to each other in coded language about just met with just met with Big Sister and and just funneled the the baklava twenty million trays of bakula was like their their code for the amount of money that they just funneled in so it's it's a good point and a good question that it's this is not limited. To Russia, there are a number of others who have observed that that this um, that these tactics of covert foreign money can can work, um, and 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 they're dedicated to it as well. I mean, I, I, we haven't talked very much about China um, either, but but them absolutely, and they're the ones who you know have the most long term prospects and the most amount of money, and clearly have shown a willingness to do this as well. Um, I mean, first and foremost, in their own uh, region, in the Asia Pacific, Australia and New Zealand, they're very aggressive about sending straw donors and princelings on to secretly fund uh, political parties that they prefer, um, Taiwan and Hong, Hong Kong, of course, in all kinds of types of ways. But that activity has continued as far as the Belt and Road Initiative goes, including to the Czech Republic. We have some important cases there and throughout Africa. So a, a lot of players all observing this, so we need to build the resilience now. Thanks. Grazie, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And I'd like to thank all our guests. Uh, that we'll be in touch again. Maybe in future we can meet again when we see what the SND group can do in parallel with the actions that are developing directly through the committee we belong to. And this meeting was concluded with my two colleagues who are called to uh, give some answers and give us an idea, some guidelines on how we can proceed. So I'll give the floor now to Gabby Bishop, who's the Shadow Rapporteur for the S&D Group for regulating the statute and funding of European parties. Uh, this is a subject that will be discussed by the Constitutional Affairs Committee. You have the floor. Thank you very much and thank you for organizing this very, very timely debate. Because as you said, we are at the moment of evaluating a report on the statute and financing of EU parties and foundations. And there will be a legal proposal at the end of the year for the Commission to amend the regulation 1141 from 2014. And therefore, we are at a process of debate, of exchanges, of hearings, also in the AFCO, um, because we already want to give strong indications to the Commission while they are preparing um, the amendments of the regulation. And I think it was very clear here that we cannot afford to be naive in this process mm -hmm. And as Iracha said in her introduction, that we need to collectively defend democracy and see the link of the funding on one hand of European political parties and of national political parties that can have a huge impact also on EU policies. And I think the nightmare also that was that is there is that we use EU public money to finance in the end 
European political parties that want to destroy the European Union and democracy uh, in Europe, or at least to destabilize uh, extremely the political systems. And therefore, uh, it is, uh, we have this regulation that covers the conditions for the financing um, of European political parties. And uh, I think this hearing is also very timely because to see uh, are these rules fit for purpose? We already had indications that with digitalization, we have new challenges we have to address. And what we can see, and I think here we got very good examples this afternoon, what we see is the immense creativity of certain uh, countries or, or, or uh, other actors there, uh, how to intervene and how to finance through intermediaries or what we call um, straw persons. And I think here the legislator also needs very clever answers to these creative approaches. And what we are doing at the moment, evaluating where the loopholes are and to see how we can address them, especially on one hand on the ceilings, for, for example, that we have qualitative and quantitative ceilings for financing European parties, to see is this sufficient. Also how we can increase transparency um, of money here, and there were very good examples to use, but also proposals already in this debate how we can address this. Um, also, what we can see, and I think here the link to the financing of the national political parties uh, is, is very important, as I, we have seen the diversity of national regulations here that can also impact on national level. And this is why we have to look uh, at this link. I mean, on European level, we have very clear regulations, no foreign money, not even also from individuals. So anyone that is not entitled to vote uh, in European elections that uh, you can not have um, take influence by, by financing, by donations. But I think what we can see in the reality, we have the authority on European level. I think we already have a level of transparency where you can see the donations from that all the European parties receive. But as we said, through intermediaries, we need better regulations here and to see the only leverage we have uh, to have an impact on the regulation on national level is to define more or better conditions if a national party wants to become a member of a European party and for this to have certain criteria, transparency, etc. so that you have a pressure to change regulation or adapt it on national level. So I think this is this is very important and very timely. I mean, we would even need more time to see uh, the influence you can take also through social media uh, and, and digitalization. But I think this is something that we have to do very fast and we want to do it so that everything is in place for the 2024 uh, elect European elections to make sure that we limit this foreign interference and that we use all the means that we have to defend free and fair elections and to defend our model of the European democracy and to link also the funding received more to the values we have, for example, in Article 2. And for this, we also need an authority that has enough resources to check because one of the lessons today also was it's not it's it's very important to have good regulation but that this is not enough you have to have the means to control it thank you very much grazie a te gabi thank you thank you for these further points i think it's fairly obvious that our commitment as a group 
uh, uh, we are developing this in various committees. And this is very important. And we'll conclude this discussion with Andreas Schiffer, who is the shadow rapporteur, the SND group in the uh, Inge committee. So Andreas can develop further the conclusions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and uh, I want to thank uh, not only to, uh, to you, Pierre Francesco, for organizing this event, but also all the uh, enlightened speakers, uh, which I think gave an, a good overview. Uh, Josh Rudolph was mentioning also the intermediate report which we published in the in the committee and which we are working on, and I, I want to say that. Uh, we highlighted some examples, but uh, still also in the committee hearings, we gathered also additional information of uh, uh, activities, sometimes with really dramatic impact, like for example, the foreign financing of the Brexit campaign, where for example, the Democratic Unionist Party, DUP, uh, spent 500,000 uh, British pounds on the Leave campaign, but not uh, in Northern Ireland, where they were elected, but for the rest of the UK. Uh, and, of, for example, where the uh, UK's national crime agency is having investigations into Aaron Banks, which was the major donor for the Vote Leave uh, campaign, uh, which also had several meetings with uh, Russians and funding allegedly from above, uh, uh, from offshore sources like the Isle of Man and, and others, where the British Conservative Party spent uh, eight million, uh, no, they spent even more, but increasingly got 8 million transfer from a Russian oligarch uh, just shortly before the referendum. Uh, and we can continue also with a BBC report on Germany where, for example, uh, Markus Fronmeier, which is a member from the extreme right AfD, uh, could become absolutely controlled, as they say, by Russia, where papers and other information uh, uh, showing his uh, uh, activities, also trips to Crimea and uh, uh, meeting with separatist controlled parts of the eastern Ukraine. Or Mr. Gauland from the same IFT, who also has uh, a lot of meetings with the Russian anti-Western ideologist uh, Alexander Dugin. And if we continue this, we see also there is impact, for example, in uh, the agreement be Greece, between Greece and North Macedonia in the days where they were funneling uh, also false information because there is the interest to stop a pro-European path uh, which was uh, gathered. Or if we look at uh, also the information which we got for uh, Hungary, where Jobbik, Bela Kovac, a former MEP, for example, also who is accused of spying on European institutions uh, for uh, Russian and also Orban, for example, is uh, accused also for uh, responding on Kremlin order and like he, that he invited a Moscow-based international investment bank to be placed also with fully diplomatic privileges in, in Russia. So, the conclusion. There is a strategy which is always the same, is that they are seeking the far-right extremist parties and they are recruiting players within the European institutions uh, to further their own position. The goal, of course, is quite simply, is amplifying polarizing discourse, stabilizing and weaken Europe, uh, and weaken also sanction reliefs, and uh, finding Western voices to legitimize Russian positions or proxy governments. In the return is, the far right gets very generous credit line or campaign contributions. So, what we have to do, there are three main areas to come to, to an end. They're the online platforms, they are lacking transparency, money flows are not clear, so what we have to do is to implement clear transparency on money in and out flows and ad libraries and track spending. The self-regulatory mo uh, model of the platforms is not functioning because it is an inherent business model that more discussions and uh, is mon monitorizing also the polarization, so therefore what we need is transparency on the algorithm, otherwise this uh, will never be uh, transparent. Then we have the shell companies. We have to call for a prohibition of uh, shell companies and transparency requirements for financial reporting of large corporations. And 
we need the harmonization of electoral and party financing uh, rules like Gabi uh, was also uh, mentioning. We have to implement clear recommendations for national level usage, spending limits, publication of donation, ban on foreign anonymous donation, effective sanction when rules are broken. I think this is also extremely crucial and to guarantee sufficient transparency. Uh, we are also looking ahead and I want to thank all the contribution for today because these are extremely wealthy and useful inputs also for our final report here for the work in the European Parliament. Bene, grazie, grazie davvero. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea Schiebert. Who really represented efficiently, efficiently the complexity of a subject which really shows what a threat that is often underestimated exists, and we've heard this repeatedly today. Our job is to keep the light on and to create and develop uh, antibodies. And we've got to stimulate and encourage the member states of the EU so that we can at least harmonize the tools that are necessary to defend ourselves, and not only at the European level, but on the national level as well. As I said right at the beginning, this is one of the initiatives on our program. There'll be others, uh, there are other points that were just being summarized now by Gabi and Andrea and if we have the opportunity uh, to deal with more and more all the various proposals we are submitting to defend our European values, the European challenge uh, from any type of external interference. We believe in this because we know that within the Union there are friends uh, of these external entities uh, operating and they are threatening our democracy. So thank you again. We will meet again. I will conclude uh, really thanking all the people who've worked here at the European Union, the interpreters, the assistants, everyone, all the staff that allowed us to hold this meeting in the best possible conditions, uh, which is the, it's the way we're working now during a pandemic. Thank you.